Hello change makers and social innovators around the globe and the African continent. We welcome you to another amazing edition of the IHA Social Impact Webinar. We're super excited to have each of you on board and we will be having a very quintessential guest, mentor, um, who will be speaking on the topic creating a bulletproof fundraising plan for nonprofits and social enterprises. Um, wherever you are, um, wherever you are across the continent, we would love to know where you are joining us from. So post in the comment section by sharing where you're joining us from and as well your name. Yes, we we'll welcome you to the August edition of the Social Impact Webinar. We're super excited and we can't wait to dive into the wealth of knowledge from our um, great um, speaker, Dr. Omotola Akishola. So um, please share with us in the comment section where you're joining us from. We would love to read from you. Um, yes, so please hit, 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 hit that share button. Share with us in the comment section where you're joining us from. Um, the last edition of the IHA Social Impact Webinar was very, very, very impacting. It was a very um, enlightening session, and we know these these promises to be, you know, times two of that, you know. And we know that you're going to have a very, very great time of um, of learning, relearning, and unlearning. All right. So we want to read from you. Hi kindly share where you're joining us from. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, so while we wait on you to share with us where you're joining us from, we will go ahead to um, um, welcome our amazing speaker, um, Dr. Motola Akishala. But before we do that, okay, thank you, Lua Shedon. Yes, you're joining us from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. Um, we would um, we would want to get to know Dr. Dr. Motola Akishala. Who is she? Who is this um, amazing speaker of ours? Um, Dr. Motola is um, the great, is passionate about entrepreneurship education, social work education, nonprofit development and management, personal and professional development, and youth development. She's a social impact expert, nonprofit funding expert, grant writer, and personal development trainer. She holds a PhD in social work two master's, master degrees in education psychology and social enterprise development and management, a bachelor's in social work with a double minor in leadership studies and psychology from Columbia College. She has a certificate in leadership development and training from Columbia College, a certificate in social entrepreneurship from George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis, two certificates in sustainable business strategy and entrepreneurship essentials from Harvard Online Business School, two certificates in grant writing from grant writing and funding. Dr. Omotola is a social work professor teaching interviewing and counseling skills, intro to social work, senior seminars and intimate partner violence at MS, MSU Makato. Dr. Omotola is also an analyst with the Good Morning Education Show, a John Maxwell team coach, trainer, speaker and desk specialist. She has been featured on Forbes, UNICEF, Grant Writing and Funding Podcast, and has won local, national, and international awards for her work in the social impact sector. She, she has won numerous awards and fellowship, including being a Congressional con con Fellow, Starting Blog Fellow, Social Innovation Fellow, Tati on the 30 Award, One Sin Scholar. Dr. Motola is the founder of the Funding Magnet, which was established in 2020. And the Funding Magnet is a full service coaching and consulting firm that works with individuals and nonprofits passionate about social impact to develop and manage organizational structure, processes, and systems. Motola has trained over 10,000 social impact makers to start, build, and scale their projects programs and organizations in over 45 countries, online and offline. She has helped generate over $1.1 million in funding for social impact. Welcome on board, Dr. Omotola, 
Dr. Motola Aki Shola. We are super excited to have you in the studio with us this um, evening. Oh, yes. Thank you, Peace Martins, for joining us. Yes. Thank you thank for you having so me. Good evening, thank everyone. So thank you so much, Dr. Motola. Yes, leading habits. Thank you for joining us, patients. Thank you for joining us also from Lagos. All right, so we will hit the ground running and permit um, Dr. Motola to commence um, our session. Um, Dr. Motola, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. I believe that if you are here, it means that you're really passionate about making change happen and you want to make a difference in the world. So without further ado, this is going to be very practical. If this is going to be very, um, I hope it's life changing for you and your organization. And we hope that you not just be here, spend your time, your data, but you actually execute. It doesn't help if you don't execute. So I would like to start that. It's not enough that you're here. I'm not impressed that you're on this webinar. What we impress me, what we impress Ideation of Africa is when you actually do something with what you're going to learn today. And we want to hear your testimony. We want to hear the change and transformation that occurs as a result of what you are learning. So thank you for joining from all over um, Nigeria and the rest of Africa. And without any further delay, um, let's get started and let's get going. So the topic for today is creating a bulletproof fundraising plan for your nonprofit or social enterprise. So for some of you, you're strictly a traditional nonprofit. You just want to do good and make good happen. For some of you, you're a social enterprise. You do the best of both worlds. You, you have a funding stream, um, and then you also do good with what you do. Either way, wherever you have, whichever kind of organization you have, this is going to be good for you. Also, one of the things I would encourage you to do is if you have friends in the social um, enterprise space, if you have friends in a nonprofit space, don't be um, a order. Share the uh, link with them for them to join you and so that you can learn together and you guys can create accountability group for each other to be able to continue this work. Awesome. So this is the outline or the agenda for today. These are the 10 things that we're going to go over. Like I said, it's going to be very practical by now. Each of you should have downloaded your worksheet. We made it into um, a Word document so that you can easily type into it. You don't have to print it if you don't want to, but if you print it, it's also good as well. So please, as much as possible, you can either follow along and do the work or listen fully and then just make notes to yourself that you're going to go back to the worksheet and use it to help you create the plan. Because our goal is that by the time we are done today, you have a plan. You know exactly what you need to do in the next 90 days to ensure that you have the right fundraising plan to raise the money that you need to do the impactful work that you do in your community and your nation at large. So we are going to talk about what you do really want. Then reviewing your past fundraising activity. One of my favorite quotes is, an unexamined life is not what leading. The same thing with an organization or a project or a program that you're running. If you don't examine what you've done before, then you cannot plan for what you need to do next. And so we, need, we are going to take some time to review what you've done before and then look at that to help in, in planning for the future. Then also we're going to do some key review of things you should measure as you go along in terms of um, what you're going to do. And then we're going to talk about the five goals that you should have for your organization as you plan forward. And then what exactly does bullet proving mean? What does that look like? We're going to go over that. And then also, like I said, failing to plan is planning to fail. So we want to make sure that you plan so that you plan to succeed, right? And then we're going to make a plan. Like I said, this is going to be very practical. And so we're going to dive into the plan to make this uh, all we needed to make. And then we're going to create your 90-day funding activation plan. The goal is that by the end of this, you have everything that you need to be able to work on your plan and you know exactly what you need to do. And then also I'm going to just do a, a quick training on knowing your call number because you need your call number to be able to go after those funding in all the multiple streams that we're going to talk about. Then at the end of it, we're going to have the Q&A. So let's get started. What do you really want? So the question, I know you're asking, like, what do I really want? And if you can even share in the YouTube, wherever you are, whether on Facebook, on YouTube, share also in the comments, like, what do you want? And this is the question I'm asking you. Right now, we are in 2020. We are about to round up 
or almost in the in, in the middle of the Q3, quarter three of 2020. And soon quarter four is coming. And usually it's the most busy time of the year. And as a change agent, as a social savior, as a champion for good, quarter four is your most important quarter. And you need to plan for it because during that period, if it, depending on the religion that you, you do, there is Christmas celebration, there is other kind of celebration going on. People are rounding up the year and th th there's just that feeling of doing good. More people want to do good during this period of the year in Q4. So you have a lot of opportunity to capitalize on the, the, what is going on in the environment. So there are so many opportunities for you to raise the funding that you need to be able to do your impactful work. And also during that period, that's the season that people also need help a lot. So my question is, what good do you want to make happen in Q4? What do you want to do? Think about the people that you work with, the population that you work with. What do they need? What would they need in Q4? Let's think about children. For children, there's Christmas party, celebration, holiday. Some children will never have um, what we call Father Christmas or Santa. You can, the organization can, may want to be the Santa for them. So what will you need to make that happen? How much will it cost for you to make that happen? So, and this can also be related to your impact goal. What do you want to do in Q4? If you can do just one thing to serve the population, the community that you work with, what would be that one thing? Put it in the comment um, um, if you get a chance or write it down in your worksheet. What would be that one thing that you want to do to make their life better, to either save their life, transform their life, or change their life for the better? What would be that one thing? Because you need to know what you're working towards. And so that's why you need to have an impact goal. That for Q4, between October to December, this is one thing that if we can do it, this will make the most difference for the people that we serve for the communities that will serve, for the family that will serve, for the youth that will serve, for the children that will serve. So what is that one thing? If you can just focus on one. Then also, I want you to consider your target. And this target is in terms of what are you going to need to make these impact goals happen? So in terms of your target, you already know your goal. Your goal is to feed 1,000 children. Maybe that's your own goal. That, oh, we know that there are a lot of homeless or children that live on the street, and they, they, we, we want to feed them during this holiday period or during this um, um, quarter. So what is your goal? Like, if your goal is 1,000, and that's the, the, your impact goal that you're striving for for Q4, how are you going to make it happen? And so part of the target is, I want you to think of three targets, which is one, in terms of money. How much do you need to make it happen? If your goal is to feed a thousand children or to give them back to school material so that in January, when they go back to school, they have everything they need to be successful, how much will you need to make it happen? So what, what is that target in terms of your the funding goal? Then the second one will be in terms of people, resources that you need. What do you need in terms of that to make it happen? And so these are the things that you need to start thinking as you continue to go along and, and do that. And now, once you have your impact goal, you have the target that you're reaching towards in terms of the funding, the resources, and the people you need to be able to reach that impact goal. Now let's really go back to what you've done. So far, the last seven months, you must have done something right in your organization. So right now, we are going to focus on reviewing your past funding activities and the things that whether you've done or, or, or you've not done. So if you look at your worksheet, I have a... Um, table for you to be able to insert things into. So the first thing we're going to think, look at, at is an event. What event did you do? How much did you generate from that event? Also, how much did you raise? How much did you raise from that event? How many grants have you written in the past one year, in the past two years? How much came from that grant? How much of those grants did you, did you win? How much were those grant a month? So write that those down. To say, okay, maybe if it's zero, put down zero. It's okay. You can start, we can start from zero and go forward. But put those things down. Review it. Look at it. What have you done? And if you've not done anything, just know, okay, it's nada. It's zero right now. But now you can plan for the future. Then the second thing, the third thing will be income generating products and services. What did you sell? in terms of services or products, like I know that we have NGOs and we have 
social enterprise. So maybe for a social enterprise, you have a co-working space and you were able to sell the the product that you were selling was space for people who, who cannot afford an office. They don't need a whole big office. They just need a place to come and do their work. They are online freelancers or whatever their job is. They don't, and then you were able to sell 20 spots. At what amount in your currency did you sell? How much profit did you make? If you are someone that provides services to people, let's say your goal is you, you, are, you do counseling and maybe they pay a certain amount for them to come and um, have access to your counseling services. How many units of that did you sell last year, two years from now? If it is whatever your income generating product or services, put it down and put the units that you sold and how much it incurred as well. Then the next is your monthly giving. A lot of you, do you have monthly givers? Like every single month regularly, there someone people are giving to you. How many did you have in the past this year? It was to amount from January to now. How many people gave to your organization? What is the average of the giving? What is the total number that they're giving? Also, if you run a crowd sourcing online fundraising, how many people gave? How much did it amount to? And then the last but not the least will, will be your corporate sponsors and your board member giving. Most of you as a social enterprise, as a nonprofit, you should have board members, right? Some might have four, some might have five, some might have up to 10 or 12. How many people in, within your board gave to your organization in the past one year, in the past two years? How much did that amount to? The same thing for corporate sponsors. This can be whether cash or in-kind gift that was given to you. So let's say you had a project and then they gave you um, like 15 pack of exercise book. You can count that. Or they gave you money towards that particular project. How many of those did you get as well? So when you review all of these things, this is going to help you to know, okay, where are we doing good on and where are we not doing good in terms of our fundraising activity? Where are you doing good on? So I know by now, and you should put in the, in the chat if possible, where are you? How many of those fundraising activities were you able to do? How many of those in all of these things that in your fundraising activities, how many of these things did you do well? Didn't you do well? Which of the one was the most productive? Which gave you the most money? Which brought in the most donations to you? And now moving on to the next slide, we are going to now talk about the things you should measure as you continue to go in terms of your um, fundraising activity. So if you look at your worksheet, you will see that I, I asked you, what is the size of your donor family? And the question is, under those is one, number of active donors. How many people have given to you in the past 12 months? 100, 50, 100, 5, 10. You need to know that number. And I'll tell you why it's important later. You need to know that number now. How many people have given to you? Then how many of those, out of those people that have given to you, how many of them are active? That they are giving to you constantly, regular, that every single month you get a donation from them. Do you have a mailing list? If you have a mailing list, how many number of those people give to your organization? So let's say you have a mailing list of 100. How about those 100? How many give to you? Is it 15? Is it 20? You need to know so that you can segment them and be able to know how do we go after these other people that are not giving to us. Beyond just the size of your donor family, the next thing is to look at your retention of your donors. Just because somebody gave you one time the zone that they'll give you for life, they'll give you everything co constantly, right? And so the next thing that we need to look at is what is going on with your retention? How many of these people are speaking to you that, yes, they didn't just give one time, but they give every single month consistently? So in the past one to two years, who has given to you consistently more than once before? You need to know that number. Then who are those numbers of people that have given to you again this year? So let's say last year, 10 people gave to you. Out of those 10 people, how many of them were they you able to retain to give to you again this year? And let, I hope that these numbers will start helping you to think. And the question you should be asking yourself is, why did they give or why don't they give? A lot of us, we don't find out. We don't take the time to see, okay, why are these people giving or why are they not giving? And I'm hoping that by the, because you're doing this review now, this will help you not just to plan for the future, but to know who do I need to go back to? Where was, where was there a break in communication that they were willing and they were moved to give the first time, but second, third time, nothing. 
So this will help us to really know where there's a break in communication and what you can do to repair that and bring back communication so that you can get the funding that you need to do the work that you want to do, okay? And so once you calculate the number of people that gave to you last versus the number that gave to you this year, this will give you your retention rate. So let's say 100 people gave to you last year and only 10 gave this year. So that means you have a 10% retention rate. So what is your retention rate in terms of people that are giving to you? You need to know that number. And, and this can help you to plan for, okay, how are we going to increase? Maybe your goal will now be for next year, between now and 2022, we want to increase from 10% retention rate to 25% or to 30% or to 40%. All of these things are really critical and key for you as you continue to move forward, right? And then the, the third part is the funding part. What does it look like? When you did your review, the, uh, the previous one, when I asked you about income generating activities, corporate sponsorship, board member giving, grant, monthly giving, event, how many of those are in your funding part? If we have to have a big circle and divide the circle into six or seven, how many circles will you have? So you have a big circle, that's all the funding possibly generated, but which is coming from, which, which pie is coming, where is, is the money coming from? Ideally, as, an, as a non-profit social enterprise, you should have at least no less than three pies in your circle. So put in the chat, how many pies, pies do you have in your circle? Is it just one? that is just board members that is giving or just people, individuals alone? Is it just grant? You need to know this. This will help you to know, okay, where do we need to work on? What do we need to do more of? Which of these funding streams or pies do we need to activate and do more of? So I want you to think about it. Where is your money coming from? Is it just from one source or just two sources? How consistent is that, is that source as well? So you need to identify that as well. Then the next is your donor love. And donor love means like overall, what was the average gift that was given to you? Let's say overall, the total amount of money that you got last year or this year as with 100,000 and is given by two, 20 people. So if you divide 100,000 by 20, what does that give you? That will be the average gift each per year that you're getting. So if you divide 20 by 100,000, whatever that gives you, that's the average amount that you're being given each year. So how can you increase that average? How, once you know your average now, the question you ask is like, do we need to increase this average or is this average good for us? And we just need to increase the number of people that can give this average. This is why you need to know your donor love number. Who were the people that gave you the largest gift, the, the, the biggest amount of money in, in, in this year and last year? Who gave you the biggest amount of money? What was the total number of money or the total number of your board members that gave to you? What is the percentage of giving? If you have 10 board members, how many of them are giving to your organization? All of these things are really critical and you need it as you continue to go forward and as you continue to do your impact work. So now, once we have reviewed the past, to be able to move forward, we need goals. And there are five areas that you need to have goals on in order for you to create your bulletproof fundraising plan. If you don't have a goal, then you can, anything will be good enough, but that is not good enough for you, especially if you want to stay the long run, if you want to be sustainable, if you want to keep doing this work over and over, not that you're going to stop your work because there's no more money, you need to have the pre goal. So the first goal will be your fundraising goal. Remember, I asked you that question. How much do you need? So I'm not going to try to make it into a one-year thing. Let's do it quarter by quarter. Q4 is coming. Quarter 4 is coming. You've decided you want to do one thing. If you can do one impact goal, that was the first thing we talked about. This is, you want to help 1,000 people or 500 people or 200 people, whatever your number is. How much will you need to carry this out? So that's your fundraising goal. So if already you've determined, okay, I want to, we want to help um, 1,000 people. To help 1,000 people, we need, you need to know that number. And I'll teach you how to calculate it accurately because most people, they don't know how to calculate this accurately. So this is going to be part of what I'm going to teach you in creating your bulletproof plan. But for now, just, from the top of your head, from the numbers you've done last year, I want you to come up with, what is your number? Put it in the comments. 
what is your number for your fundraising goal for this last quarter for this year? How much will you need to create the impact that you want to make in your community, in your society, in your country or in your continent? How much do you need? That's your fundraising goal. That our target is 200,000. You need a number that you can strive towards. So what is your number for this coming quarter? What is your number? So that's the first thing. That's the fundraising goal. You need a fundraising goal. The second one is now going to be your donor retention goal. This is why we did the review for last year and, and, and this current year that we are in. How many people have given to you? How have you been able to retain it? Let's say in 2021, in 2020, 100 people gave to you. But when you look at your number for this year, only 50. What happened? Why is it that you have a lower number of people giving to you this year versus last year? So your donor retention goal is to say, okay, right now, after we calculated this and it's done the review, we only have 10% that we've been able to retain of people that are giving to us. We want to increase it. We want to increase our donor to at least 25%. So in this donor retention goal, the plan is to say, how are we going to do this? Where, where did we mess up? Where was there a break in communication? Is it that we didn't send thank you on time? Is it that we didn't appreciate these people? Is it that we didn't, after the project ended, we didn't give them a report? All of those things add up. Because I want you to put yourself in your donor's shoes. They are giving to you. Like, let's say you, there is someone named, let's, let's use Miss Tony for example. She gave to my organization. And then I didn't even bother to say thank you. I just said thank you flippantly on a WhatsApp message. Thank you, I saw your donation. Or thank you, I saw the alert. That is not good enough. Will you, do you think that she will be motivated and inspired to give less? Of course not. She was like, this was a miss. At next time, I'll put my money where they will appreciate it. So you need to think about it and say, how are we treating our donor? Because your donor retention matters. If you don't have enough donors, you cannot meet your fundraising goals, right? So if you cannot work to keep the donors you already have that given to you, it may be harder to even acquire more, but it is possible to acquire more donors. But the best way for you to be able to have predictable money, funding coming in, is to retain what you already have, those that have already given to you in the first place. And so that is very important. You need to create a plan. Have a goal. Our goal is to increase our donor retention from 10% to 50%, whatever it is, or make it realistic, 30%. Make that we are realistic and do that. And so, oh, okay, I'm going to increase it. So please make sure that you do that and you, you have your donor retention plan. And so, okay, we're going to check our communication. Did we say thank you after they gave the gift? How did we say thank you? Did you tell them exactly what their money is doing? How it made a difference? Did we share progress reports on our project and what we use the money for? All of these things matter as you go forward. Then the next one for you to think about is your donor acquisition plan. It's not enough to retain the people that are giving to you. You have to start looking for new revenues. How can we get more people to give to our organization? Think about it. Even for a for-profit business, they're always looking for new customers, new customer acquisition. So it's the same thing as a social enterprise, as a non-profit. You need to have donor acquisition goals that, okay, in Q4, we want to increase, we want to get at least 30 new donors. That's basically 10 new donors per month. It is possible. It is realistic. It is achievable. So the question is, how do you reach this goal? So your question might be, okay, let's look at, at our top givers. And that's why I asked that question previously. Your top givers. These are the top 10 people that have given to you. Look at it. Why did they give to you? Why did they keep giving to you? Can you make them ambassadors? Who can recruit more people? to come and volunteer and then through volunteering, they start giving to your organization. So what do you need to find a way to collaborate with other organizations or look for a way to pitch your organizations and the work you do to um, a TV or radio station so that more people can hear about the wonderful, impactful and life-changing work that you're doing. Because you cannot afford to be a best kept secret. If you are a best kept secret, then nothing is going to change. You're going to stay stagnant, and then you cannot even increase in terms of number of people you want to impact, number of lives you want to change. 
So that is why it is really critical that you ensure that you always have a donor acquisition goal. Our goal is that this month, 10 more new donors that have not given to us before. But you have to think through, how are they going to discover us? So I want you to start thinking, and if you want to share in the comments, how can people get to know more about your work? What practical step can you do to cultivate more people? Do you need to network more? Do you need to be more visible on your social media platform, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram? Pick one. How can you ensure that you build this rapport for people to discover your work? Do you need to have a website that is discoverable? Do you need to join groups on WhatsApp or any other um, platform for them to get to know more about your work? So I want you to think of it and at least put one in the comments. One thing that you're going to do to get more people to know about your work who can now become donors, okay? Then the, the fourth one is your program and project goals, right? You know, we talked about it in the beginning, the first, like, so the pick one goal, at least for this next quarter. Some of you may have more than one, but I always like to start with one. So what is your program or project goal? Your goal, let's say you have a program or project coming up in November, and your goal is, okay, we want to teach 100 youth um, skill acquisition. We want them to be able to become job creators, not just job seekers. How are you going to go about it? Who, who, who do you need? What partnership do you need? Who needs to be there? Who, who do you need to talk to? Which of your team members can do it? What equipment do you need? Make a list. What will you need to make this project successful? Don't just do projects for the sake of doing it. Have a plan towards that. Have a goal. Okay, our goal is 100 youth. How are you going to find those 100 youth? Are, are you going to ask them to pay a token to be part of it? What is the plan for that? So you need to, okay, our, our goal is 100 for this project. This is how we're going to do. We're going to reach out to all the universities or the secondary school, and then we're going to get them and tell them to apply. Is there going to be an application process, or is it just for everyone? Is there an age limit? All of these things are important. You need to be very clear. And why, do you know why all of this matters? Because once you start activating your funding streams, it's easy. So when you're talking to a corporate person, a person that will give you a grant, a grant or a grant funder, or an, you know these things. You're not like saying, um, I think, I, no, because they will not have any confidence in you, right? So you need to know these things and say, you know what, this is what we're going to do. We are going to help 100 people to have skill sets that they can use to earn money so they can become job creators because we have so many people that are seeking jobs and the unemployment rate is so high. And so we want to make a difference in this way. And our goal is like 100 people must be able to have the skill sets to create jobs for themselves before we go into the new year. So you need to know your program goals and break it down. Because once you can break it down now, and you know, you know what you're working towards. You know, there's a Bible verse that says, Abacus 2.2, that says, write the vision, make it plain, so that everybody knows exactly what you're running towards, right? And so that's why you need to know these things. And the last, the, the, the last but not the least is your team goals. It's not enough for you to have the fundraising goal, the donor retention goal, the donor acquisition goal, your program goal. You need a team goal because as the funder, as the visionary, you alone cannot do all of this. So you need a team. So I want you to think of it. How many people do you have in your organization right now? Who can help you in each of these other four goals that we talked about? You need a class captain. Think of it as a class captain. You need a class captain for each of these goals. For the fundraising goal, who's going to spread it? Who is going to be responsible for it? For your donor retention goal, who is going to be your communication officers? Who will help you to create the right communication to get you going? For, for the donor acquisition, who is going to be your networker? Who will network across different groups and different social media platforms to get more people to discover your work and want to give to it? Who is going to be your program person? Who is going to help you to ensure that your program runs smoothly? That will be the program manager that people can talk to if they need to volunteer and things like that. All of these things matter and they're important. And if you don't have these things, then you're just going to do things up, 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 rapidly, and then it's not going to help you. So these things matter and they're important as you continue to go forward. So I want you to put in, in, the, in the chat, out of these five goals, where, where are you on a scale of one to 10? Where one is like, not at all, or 10 is you're doing good, rate yourself. On a scale of one to 10, put it in the chat. Where are you? Where are you in all of these five areas? Where are you on this? Okay, so now moving on, 
now that we've you, you you know the goals that you have to do so how do you create a bulletproof fundraising plan a bulletproof and think about the word bulletproof bulletproof means like if someone should shoot at you it's not going to arm you right it's not going to let things die it's not going to scatter everything all your particles in your body around right so what we mean by a bulletproof a bulletproof fundraising plan is not just relying on one source of, source of funding. A bulletproof fundraising plan is having multiple streams of funding coming into your organization. And you know, we've done this review, like in the beginning, I told you, out of all of the, those things, um, where did you get money last year? Where did, did the money come from? So for you to create a bulletproof fundraising plan, you need multiple streams of income. One out of seven is not good. It's not sustainable. It will not, it will cap your impact. But imagine having four out of seven. So that means you have grant, you have corporate sponsorship, you have board members giving, you have monthly donors, people that give to you every single month. That's four, then, or one, you only have individual donors, or that is, and that is it, or you only rely on just one grant. It is not helpful. And I'll give you a practical example. When I started in the, in, in the social, um, enterprise field in the non-profit world, I used to just self-fund by myself alone. I used to just self-fund and you say, oh, I'll do it. When I say, and it is okay, because you know, most of us, we start out of passion. We're so passionate about making change happen. So we're like, we can do it by ourselves or we don't need, and then, but it keeps enlarging because the truth is, as DDK says, wicked problems, they don't stop. They keep, in, think of what has happened with the pandemic and the way the world is going. They don't stop. So they keep increasing. The more people that need you, that is the solution that you carry, they keep increasing. So you need different strengths to, to be able to ensure that you can help as many people as possible to help them get to where they need to get to, okay? So that is why you need multiple streams. So for you to have a bulletproof fundraising plan, it has to be inched on more than one source of funding. It cannot just be one, only board members, only grants, only corporate sponsors, sponsors, only monthly givers, only income generating activity. You need to diversify. You need to, and I'll give you an example. As I continue to grow in my own journey, like, and then two years down the, after I created my nonprofit, so we got grants. So I'm like, oh, great. I don't have to self-fund myself in my organization again. The first year was almost like myself self-funding. And then secondly, like we got plenty of grants and I relied on that alone. Guess what happened? One year, we were supposed to get a certain amount of money. We won it and everything was wonderful, but something happened. There was an economic crisis. And then we got a letter saying, we're so sorry, due to the change in the economy, we are not able to fulfill this grant again. And so we, we apply again next year, but for this year, we are suspending any funding. What did you think happened? I didn't have a backup. I didn't have anything. I had to start scrambling. Then I went back to self-funding. And that was what taught me the lesson. And that's why I'm such a champion of multiple streams of income. Having more than one sources. Because I know what it feels like. Like, we had to temporarily close down our program for six months. And it was so disappointing having to call the parents, talk to the students that we're working with. That we're so sorry. We can no longer do this again. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want that to happen to your impact work. The people that you are serving, the community you are serving, they deserve more. And it all starts with the planning. That's what we call the fundraising plan. You need to plan. Remember, to fail to plan is to prepare to fail. And you cannot lift up their hope and then now kill it by lack of planning. So that is why you need to bulletproof your fundraising effort. And it requires thinking in diversity, thinking in multiples it cannot just be one it cannot just be one okay now that you understand what it means to bless proof how do you do that so before i jump into that i want to give you some statistics in last year between 2020 and 2021 more than 410 billion dollars was given to the non-profit work world more than 410 billion was given to the non-profit world how many of that amount came to you? That's my first question to you. And you don't have to put it in the comments this time around. You can order, order, order to it. But I want you to think about it. How many of these money are you getting? 
how many are you getting? It is critical for you to start thinking. The truth is, there is money. Because I know I hear people say, that, oh, there's no money in non-profit. There's no money in social enterprise. That is a lie. There is a lot of money. The question is, are you activating it? Are you putting yourself in the position to get it? Are you doing everything you can to get this money that is in the non-profit world? So there is money. I just want to clear up anything. If you, if you were in doubt before, I want you to write it in the comment. There is money in non-profit. Put it in the comments. Like even you say it and say there is money. Because a lot of people say, oh no. And, and this is one of my favorite uh, mantras. Like you don't have to go broke to make a difference. You don't. And it starts with planning, having a bulletproof plan. And this is why we're here today, to show you how to create it, to create it and work the plan. If you create the plan and you do the work, you are going to get money. You're going to get this money. You're going to get it. So I want you to say to yourself, put it in the comment, there is money in nonprofit, abundance of money. There is. So don't let anybody tell you that, oh, you're going to be poor for life. You can never make money in nonprofit or in social sectors. There is money in nonprofit. The question is, are you planning and prepping to be able to acquire this money? And this is why we're here, to show you how you're going to get it, okay? So, now to the multiple streams. If you like, you can take a screenshot if you want, that's fine. These are at least six or seven different funding streams that are available for you in the nonprofit world, in the social service enterprise sector. So there's the foundation giving, which is like grants. There is corporate giving, which can be cash or kind. Corporate giving, these are not foundations. They are companies like less, like depending on the country you are in, MTN, Microsoft, Apple, um, banks that they may not, and they, they can give to your organization through their corporate social responsibility. That's what we meant by corporate giving. Those are corporate sponsors. Then there's individual donors, which are either they give you monthly or once in a while or one-time donation. These are people. They are not entities like companies. They're not foundation. They are individuals like you and I. Who are like, they just want to do good. I care about education. So I always give to ed anything education. I care about women development. So I always give to anything women development. I care about youth development and social entrepreneurship and creating more job creators than job seekers. So any project that has to do that. So every month consistently, I have like five to six charities that I give to personally beyond my own charity and the work that I do. So these are their individuals. There's something they care about. There's a particular project or population or interest. And so they give to them. Those are what, what we mean by individual donors. So for some, I give monthly. For some, I give quarterly, depending on how I'm led to give. So that is that. And then there is in-kind donation, which is like, this can be from individuals, from foundation for corporate sponsors, where you need something, you need an office space. And they give you an office space. So I'll tell you, give you the example. When I started my own nonprofit, we didn't have the money to rent a space. So what did we do? We hacked around. And then we got the government to give us the, so like our, when we started that program, it was after school. So it's from, from 2 to 6 p.m. And you know, like schools end from like 8 to 2 then in, in, my, in my own time. I don't know if things have changed, but back in Nigeria then, like school usually ends from 8 to 2. So they said, okay, yes, you can use the space from 2.30 to 6. So every single day, Monday to Friday, we were giving, we had access to the old school to use from 2.30 to 6 or 6.30 sometimes in, 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 in the run. So this can be things. So it can be either, and this can be food supply, school supplies, whatever it is that you need to be able to carry out your project or your program. That is what we mean by in-kind donations, okay? And then there is income generating services. So what services can you provide as an organization, as a social enterprise, that when people need it, and when you do these services, people can pay you. Let's say normally they'll go to somebody and the person will charge $150. But because you are a social enterprise or you're an NGO, you're like, you know what? You, we, you will take $75 and you pay half of what you normally pay for somebody that is just a for-profit work. So what kind of service can you do in that regard? So for instance, one of the services that um, we do, we do mentorship. And then we've been able to like, like in, with my organization, like partner with some schools. And so we provide mentors to them and then they pay us 
a certain amount and that helps us to be able to do the work for those that cannot afford to pay us, which are the public school, or we do training. We provide training on leadership, on entrepreneurship, curriculum development for leadership and entrepreneurship creation. So those were some of our own products then. So we'll go and then we'll pitch it to like a private school or whatever, and then they pay us and then we use that. So I want to start thinking based on the talent, the skills, the educational background, your expertise. What can you do? What, how can you leverage those things and create income generating services that you can pitch to another sector, to another industry that needs it, that can afford it, so that they can pay you guys to do it and then you can bring in the money to do the good that you do. Another one on this pie is the income generating product. So I'll tell you the ones that we did for my organization. We've done different things. We did farming. <laughs> we have a one acre of land. We planted all of um, fruit, vegetables, banana, plantain, and we made money from it and we sell it each season. So we usually plant at least three things every year. Maize is one of them, plantain is one of them, and sometimes we plant like peppers. And we use them and then we sell it. And, and with cassava, we've done it. Then we even have, we even did um, animal rearing, where we rear cows, lamb, goats, and then when they are ripe enough, we, we kill them and we share it. And then people, like we will ask for people that will share a cow every six months. And then they'll come and they'll pay us and then we'll make our money out of it. We move the money we use to re rear the animal and then we have profit left. These are examples of products. We've done egg too, where we got 1,000 layers of egg. Uh, 1,000 layers, 1,000 N layers, layers, N, and then we, and then every day, they bring about 15 to 25 crates of eggs. Like people used to pay us, they would pay us in advance for our eggs. So there are many different possibilities. And all of these things I'm mentioning, these are based on my own interest, my area of expertise, the things that I love. I've always loved agriculture as a, as a, as a person. So when I was in primary school, I used to look for a way. I used to plant stuff, beans, whatever you call it, shoko, whatever, like anything. I used to plant it. So when I started my nonprofit, I'm like, yes, I'm going. So we got somebody to donate, give us money to buy a, an acre of land, and then we built a pen place for it. We where we raise, we even raise pig. We sell pig. Like we've done it all in terms of. But like what I'm telling you is like in your own interest. I want you to start thinking, and you can put it in the chat. What do you have in your hand right now as a skill set, as an experience, as an education that you can turn into a product or services that can benefit the work you do for the world, for your community, for your society? You don't have to copy what we did if you don't have an interest in it. I want you to think deeply and look at it and brainstorm with your team. What do you have? What can you use? And it will take time, it will take some time, but once you figure it out, it works. Like people still ask about our heads. So you can do those things. And, and so these are like the different funding pathways that you can explore. And then there's even board members too. Board are important. Your board should not just be figurehead. Your board should give their time, their talent, and their treasure, money. They must put their money where their mouth is. It's not enough for them to just say, oh, we're just going to be your, your board and decorate your, decorate your, what do you call it, your website. And say, oh, I'm on the board of this. No they must put their money where their mouth is so they can be part of this pie, even though it's not, made, it's not put here. So please start thinking about it. How many of these are you going to activate this coming quarter? How many can you activate? If you already have, if you already have one in your pie, how can you turn it into three? How can you turn it into four? So start thinking about it, write it, put it in the comments as part of accountability to say, you know what? I am going to work, me and my team, by next quarter, we're going to activate two more or three more of these funding streams. Okay? So these are the different funding pathways, and it is important that you activate each and every one of them. Okay? So please, which of these are you going to activate? Which one do you have that you're doing currently, and which one do you need to work on? I hope you are finding this valuable. Please let us know in the chat if you're finding, finding this valuable, okay? And so this is an example I want to show you. Why failing to plan equals planning to fail. This is by Benjamin Franklin. That's the owner of the court. I love court a lot. So let's look at the, the um, depending on what you're looking at, the left side of things. Um, there's ABCD nonprofit. See the way he's looking. He's like on his phone. He's like, I don't know what to do. Or like, 
there's no money coming, you know, I'm tired of self-funding, you know. It doesn't have any goals, no review, you just want to do good. And like I said, passion is great. Passion can get you started, but passion is not enough to go take you forward, to do the big things that you need to do, to do the really the life-changing, impactful work. You need more than passion. Passion will start you, but you need more of a passion to go forward. So here you have this uh, Mr. A. No goals, no reviews, no planning, no funding stream. It's just self-funding. And now he's at this point, it's like, I cannot do it again. My wife is pregnant. I'm just, this is an example. I, I put it an example. We need to like, I need to take care of other bills. And now I'm thinking of closing down my organization because I don't have any plan. I don't have any funding stream. Or oh, look at this other person. Let's call her Sarah. See the way she's smiling, forward looking. KIJK nonprofit. They have a smart goal. They know exactly what they want in all of those five goals that we talked about. Remember the fundraising goal, retention goal, donor acquisition goal, all of that. They have that. They have constant review every month, every week. They're reviewing what they're doing, what is working, what is not working. What should we start doing more of? What should we do less of? What should we continue? They have strategic plan in place for each area of these things. They have multiple streams. They have at least four of the, the board members are giving. They've been able to create a monthly giving program. They get some grants. They get some company sponsorship. So she is forward looking. She's excited for the challenge. She's excited for more opportunity to do more, to give more, to help our community. So which one are you? Are you the ABCD nonprofit or the KIJK nonprofit? And it's, it's okay. There's no shame wherever you are. This is why you are here today. So that you can move forward. If you're in the ABCD nonprofit, there is hope for you. Okay, there is hope for you. There is so much, much hope for you. And if you are K I J K, you can still do better. You can still do better. So it, 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 it's not like just because you are there, you cannot do better. You can do better because the world needs more of us. The world needs us to serve more people. So you can definitely do much, much, much better. So irrespective of where you are, whether you are A B C D kind of person or you are the K I J K nonprofit, there is hope for you. There is hope for you, and I'm glad that you are here today so that you can make the plan, you can correct those things that need to be corrected and be on your way to being like Sarah, who is forward looking, who is excited about the future, okay? All right, so this is like, I'm just giving you the pie chart of what this might look like. In, as you're organizing, like I said, I'm not saying that you must have all these ones specifically, depending on where you are, I'm just using this as an example. So let's say, 15% giving comes from your not all. Like, let's say your goal is 200,000 each. That's what you need to do project to your program. So, um, for your board giving, 50% of that 200,000 is coming from your board. 10% of that 200,000 is coming from your income generating activity, whether it's a product or service. 15% is coming from grants. Let's say, let's say you apply for 10 grants and only two of them said yes to you that's 15% that is coming. Then 30% is coming from corporate sponsorship. So 30% of your 200,000 per quarter that you need to run your organization is coming from your um, or, or from corporate sponsors. And then 30% is coming from monthly giving from individuals. So this is how this can look like. I don't want your pie to just be one. Like it needs to be distributed. So this looks, this is a, a, a good like LG look that it should look like. It can, it can change and shift, but you should have a pie that at least has four, no, at least three maximum, but at least from three upward, you should have at least three pie in your circle for funding stream. It should not just be one. It should not just be two, okay? And that one or two should not be you self-funding your organization. So where is your pie? If you were to draw your pie on, on, on your own sheet, what do you have in your pie? What is the percentage of giving coming from each of these different funding streams? You need to know that, okay? So do draw your own stream, draw your own circle, create your own pie. Where are you? So they can see vividly. This is where you have, so where you need to be, okay? Let's keep going. So now it's time to make the plan. Like I said, this is going to be very practical. I'm not here to just um, inspire you. No, I want you to do the work. I want you to work. When you work, it works. And it starts with making a plan. And so this is a quote from Adrienne Sturgeon, and from she's the co-founder and co-director of Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy. And she said, organizations with a reaching fundraising plan 
consistently outperform organizations without one. So let's be honest with ourselves. We are family here, right? We, if you don't have a plan, but when you have a plan, how well do you do? How, well, how effective are you? So that's why we need to make a plan. And it might look like, oh, it's a lot, it's stressful, but I promise you, do it now. You can enjoy it later. A quote that I love so much is like, play now, pay later. Or pay now, play later. So this is you paying the price for the price. So the P-R-I-C-E for the P-R-I-Z-E. And this is how you do it. Because once you can work out this plan and, and you have the plan and you activate it, everything becomes easier for you. You don't have to wake up at night thinking, oh my God, how do we fund this project? How do we provide this money to help these people? So that's why you need to plan. So you are going to be better. Your organization is going to be better and less stressed out when you have a plan and when everybody knows the plan and, and, and starts activating the plan. So let's, let's make a plan. So again, just to reiterate, to fail to plan is to prepare to fail. And I know you guys are not failure. You don't want to fail, right? So this is why we're going to make a plan. So there are three in ingredients in making a plan, okay? And so the three ingredients in making a bulletproof fundraising plan is one, having smart goals. And I know you guys know the acronym for SMART goal, but I'll go over it again. But specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-bound. Your goal has to be smart. It can just be you want to help one million people by next Q4. That is not a smart goal. So if you look at where you are and what you've done versus where you want to go, that is not smart. But you can do incremental. You can, be, you can do incremental. Okay, this quarter, all we can do is 50. And we, once we do it well, good. Maybe next quarter in 2021, the Q1, we'll now do 100 or 150. So I want you to be really down to earth and realistic in your plan. It's good to have big vision. It's good to dream big. But you have to start where you are. And that's why we did the review. Where are you in your funding, in your program? Where are you? So this can help you to really plan well and have a good foundation for what you want to build for the next coming months and years, okay? And then the second one is calendaring it, like writing it down, writing it down. And then the third one is having key person that is leading it. So, and I refer back to this abacus too, because it breaks it down easy. Write the vision, the smart goal. This is what you want to accomplish. Make it plain. Calendar it, put it down, like know what you're doing next month, two months from now, three months from now, so you're not confused. If they, like, cause for instance, you never know where you will be, where there'll be somebody that wants to give you money. Like, and then this is like asking, what is your plan? But, and then you don't know anything, you don't have any plan, you don't have any calendar, oh, this will But once you have it written down and you calendar it, it's easier to share that vision, to share those goals with those people, irrespective of wherever you are, you will never be caught unprepared. You never be caught surprised that, oh, I didn't know. Okay? And then the last one, so that all who run, everybody in your organization, volunteer, oh, board member, oh, staff member that is paid, oh, they need to know where you're going. They need to know what you're working towards. They need to know the target, the goal that you're working towards. Okay? So let's continue in making this plan. So again, just going over the ingredient one, I would say it's never, it doesn't get old. Smart. What exactly are you trying to accomplish? You know, that's why I asked you in the beginning. In Q4, what do you want to make happen in Q4? Okay? So what exactly? Is this 50 students you want to help in this particular community? Like specific. Don't you say you want to help um, 100 or 500 out of each children in Lagos? In what community in Lagos? In what community in Ocean State? Is it the rural? Is it like, is it Oshodi? Is it uh, where, like in what community? Be that specific. Or oh, we want to mentor 100 students. In what school? Private school, public school, primary school, secondary school? You need to really know it and know exactly, be very specific. Because when you're speaking to people, if you're not specific, then anything goes. Anything goes. They'll say, oh, this person is not serious. They don't even know exactly what they are doing. So you need to be very specific about it. Then the second part, measurable. How will you know that you've achieved it? How will you know? How will you quantify it? Is it by the number of people that signed up, by the number of students? Like, how will you know? Or by the, the, the increase in the academics performance. Let's say the student you're working with, like you're, you were really specific and you say, you know what, you want to work with students in secondary school, 
who are getting C's and D's and are going to work with 50 of them and want to help them increase their grade within one time from this September when they resume to December, want to increase their grade and move those C students to B students or move those D students to C plus students. That is measurable. Not just like, oh, we just want to help 100 and then you, you're not specific and measuring exactly what you're helping them in. Help is not measurable. Help is not measurable. So you need to really measure it and really put metrics and numbers to it, okay? Then A, is it generally possible to achieve it? As I ask you, don't just shoot for 1 million. Maybe in 10 years, you can do 1 million. But if you want to do 1 million in the next four months, that is less than this year, you are deceiving yourself. Yes, I believe in miracle. I believe in the power of God. Even God is a planner. God himself is a planner. So you have to measure it. And you have to make that, is this achievable? Can we really do this in this time that we have? Is, is it achievable? What can we undo? And how you measure what is achievable? What is number of volunteer you have, your team capacity, your funding, your fund, funding goals that you have, the money that you have in your bank account. Is it achievable? Can we achieve, do this excellently well? How many people can we serve excellently well and do it well? Okay? And then the how, is it relevant? Does it contribute to your agency goal? Whether it's your revenue, like we can talk about this in revenues, or we can also talk about it in impact too. You know, just revenue. How does this help you, your mission, your vision? Because sometimes a lot of you, you are in this alignment with your vision and your vision for your organization. And that is a whole topic for another day. But whatever it is that you're trying to make happen, is it in alignment? Okay? And then T is time, time bound. It has to, it can't just be forever. Oh, we just have one student and mentor them. No, be specific about your timeline. What is the timeline? By the end of this coming semester or from September to December, these students are going to move from C to B students. And this is how you're going to do this. This is how we're going to attain it and you list the steps, okay? And then now to the next one, which is, I hope you can see it like, like this is a sample smart fundraising goal. I'm just giving you, okay, okay, okay. Your goal is like, let's say, you want to really activate one of the funding streams. And say, okay, I, we don't have a monthly giving. We, give, we know people that give once in a while. They only give us emergency fundraising. A lot of you, I am sure, you do emergency fundraising. It's only one week, two weeks before your program. Then you start running Elsa Scatter. That's when you share a lot. And everybody see your WhatsApp, your, your Telegram, your, and then you, you're blasting everybody. But if you have a plan and you've been working the plan for the past three months, you don't have to be worried two weeks, one week before your work. They say that, okay, this is what I'm going to do. No. So let's say you're going to launch a monthly giving program by a certain date. So let's say by October of 31st, we want to launch a monthly giving program. Our target is like, if we can get 10 people to consistently give us 1,500, I don't care whatever your number is in your currency, pick it. Now, okay, our goal is like every month at least on average, we want to get 250 Naira or 100 thousand cities or hundreds whatever your currency in your country is how much are they going to give to you like do you want and how many people do you want it from then what do you need to do to be able to get that so maybe in the next step we're like, we going to create a culture of philanthropy you we start with our ball and stuff and say you people will you tie to our organization will you be willing to give a percentage of your salary to our organization whether it's one percent zero point five percent i don't care like let them like, let's start that up. That we so that when people ask us, like, okay, what are you guys doing beyond just doing the programs? Like, we also give too. I give to my own organization too. I have a specific like I tie to them, like beyond just my own normal tie to church and everything. So you can you can it's okay, let's start from within. Let's start from within. So that when we go out there and ask for grants and they ask us how many percentage of your board member is giving. You can say yes, 50%, 100%. And you know that you guys are practicing what you're preaching or what you want them to do to you as well. And I said, that can be the next step. Say, okay, yes, we're going to do this. Or, or this is the person that will be in charge of accus um, helping us to get more new donors and do donor accusation or helping us to retain you um, past donors. So somebody gave to you last year, but they're not giving this year. What is the plan? What is the step to get there? So that can be part of your plan. Then the next one, like we're going to recruit two new board members or bo volunteer members to be on our committee for our fundraising goal for our monthly giving program we are going to grow our donors base by using facebook instagram whatsapp telegram linkedin whatever it is that you wherever you're social don't just be there passively how can you let them know about what you care about and you 
make them give towards what you're doing, okay? And then maybe your goal is that we're going to improve our donor retention. No, we're going to move from 5% to 10% or 5% to 25%. All of these things matter. And so you can list it and then I'll teach you how you now document it for who is going to be responsible for what, okay? And But this is just like a really like simple description of this is what this look like. This is our goal. This is how we're going to work towards it. And this is how we're going to make it happen. Okay. All right. So this is like ingredient two and three. So calendaring it and aspiring it. So it's not just enough to say, okay, yes, we are going to write the vision. We are going to write the goal. But if you have a goal, but it's not tied to somebody or, or a specific person responsible for it, a specific team, then it's not going to happen. Because you need to constantly review it. How are we doing on this goal? Are we at 5%, 10%, 20%? And so this is a sample fundraising plan. So this is just like a um, fictional organization, sweaters for pinging, okay? And so you can say, okay, this is Q10, January, February, March. And this is the activity that we're going to do. In January, we're going to apply for 10 funding for, for grant. In February, we are going to try and get monthly our uh, monthly donor giving going, right? Then the next one is like, how much will it cost? What is the cost? Do you need to hire a grant writer? Or do you need to pay for somebody that is in communications and intern, like pay an intern a cheap amount of money to come and focus on helping you to activate and write those grants that you've identified? Then who is responsible? Is it the um, program director, the um, executive director, is it the intern communication um, intern person? Is it whoever it is, you need to assign it to somebody. Then what is the goal? What is the money to go that you're hoping for when, to get from? Okay, so you do apply for 10 grand toll, and let's say they give us um, $1,000 each, and let's say out of those 10 grand, we get five. That's at least $5,000 coming in, right? Okay, then how much did you pay the grant writer? To help you get that 5,000, you can have that expense or income also reported there. Then when do you expect the result? When, when do you hope to get this money? And then what is the target towards it? And then you can also talk about resources and notes so that for, let's say you, you are changing your team members and new people are coming in. When you look at this plan, they can say, okay, this is what happened. Maybe they didn't reach, they were, the goal was 10, but we only were able to apply for five. So under the resource slash notes, you can put note of what happened, how you, you reached the goal or how you missed the goal and things like that, right? So for each month, for which area of each different areas of your organization, you can create this plan. You can create this plan and walk it and say, you know what, this is what we're going to do. And there's a sample, it's not exactly like this, that is in your worksheet as well. For you to start thinking and really owning it, okay, this is person that's responsible for it. So that you know how the work is distributed and who is doing what. Like I said, only just the funder or the executive director should not be doing everything. That's why you need to build your team. So that might be your goal. That might be a goal for September. Build more team members. Recruit more team members, whether as volunteer, whether as paid staff, whether as interns to support the work that you do. So this is the second and final, the third ingredient. Put it in a calendar, right? Make it plain. And then tax someone to do it and, and, and let them get the work done, okay? And then once the person is done, so this is like a sample weekly team member fundraising activity plan. So each person in your organization, every week should have something they are working towards, whether it's for the fundraising. And I'm using the fundraising part because this is what we're focusing on fundraising. We can have a whole webinar about team building, but this is not that. So that's why all my example is focused on fundraising, right? And so this can be, okay, this is this person, you know, um, Miss Tony. This that it lies when I can put her name there and say, okay, this is my goal for this week of September 1 to September 7. These are the things I want to accomplish. These are the people I'm going to call or follow up with, or organizations I'm going to call, corporate sponsors I'm going to call and follow up with. Okay, these are the pipeline, these are the people I've spoken to. This is what they said. This is the amount I asked for. This is the next step I'm going to take. You need to have it. A lot of you don't have that. You don't have that. Everybody's just like, they don't know what they are doing. They don't have any plan for the week. You need to plan it. Okay, my goal is this week, five organizations. I'm going to talk to five organizations. I'm going to call somebody in MTN, somebody in Glow, somebody in um, um, Nessus, somebody in Indomie. Um, what do you call it? Um, yeah, whichever the company or P&G, whatever the organization is in your country that I want to call these people and say, how can you partner with us? 
Can you give us in-kind donation? Can you give us cash? What is it that you can do for us? Do you have any corporate sponsorship that is available that we can apply for on those kind of things? Or you're going to, I'm going to research five grant opportunities that we may apply for in this coming quarter. So everybody in your organization should have the dashboard of what they're doing weekly. This is my tax. This is what I'm going to do. And then you should review it every week. Okay, how are you doing on it? What did you do? What did not go well? What support do you need? All of these things matter. And this is how you build a bulletproof plan. But it's not enough to write the plan. If, but if you don't assign somebody to do it and you don't do it consistently, then nothing is going to change. So part of the bulletproof plan requires you to not just write the plan, not just to calendar and assign somebody to it, but reviewing like, where are we? What have we done? What, where are we not doing things well? What can we do better as we continue to go on? Okay, so now using your worksheet, and you can use it now or later, I want you to start planning for different funding streams, okay? And we're rounding up here, and then we'll be able to ask, ask, um, answer questions and everything. So as you're thinking of Q4, Q4 is October to December. So you still have September to plan and make the plan, recruit team members, do your reviews of your past, last year this year you did not done that now that you know what to do you can use september to like get ready so that october november you can start activating things right so i want to start thinking how many events are you going to run in next quarter are you going to run a back to school event or whatever event are you going to run a uh, i know one of the events that we used to do here when i was the you I, I i was living in south carolina um and so one of the organizations i used to volunteer for a non-profit the event they focus on homeless people, right? So guess one of the events they run that help them to raise money. They do homeless for the homeless because yeah, during a period, like in November, it's always very, very cold. Like sometimes it will snow and it's like, you need like to wear jacket, gloves, everything, like boots and all. And for homeless people used to really, like it's always so cold and they used to suffer a lot during that period. So guess what we, we called it? We call it homeless for homeless. I was part of the, um, the committee that brainstormed and came up with it. Homeless for the homeless. And guess what we do? So we pick the coldest day of the year and invite everyone. We do go on radio, TV. Usually we get it for free. And then we send announcements out in the newspaper and everything and invite people, college students, old people. I don't care. Married couples. Second, like, come and do homeless for the, like, come and sleep outside on the coldest night of the year as your support for homeless people to get them back on track. And then they pay for this. They pay $25 each to be part of it. And we don't, they, if they like, they can be cardboard. If they like, they can be uh, whatever they want to spread, or their own whatever. But they're going to experience it. And then we have like 10, 12 homeless people who are you, really homeless that we're working with. They stay in the tent that is heated. And, and then people can go around and talk to them if they want to and just hear their story and things like that. But guess what? Every year, we raise, always, always raise over $15,000 from that homeless for the homeless event. So I want you to start thinking, depending on your population, your community, your state, what event can you do that is relevant to the work that you do, that you can encourage people to be part of? What events, like if it's sports, some people can do, can do a sport camp and tell people during this holiday season, ask parents to come and like, they should come and whether it's soccer, football, whether it's whatever it is, or running, whatever, and say, we're doing a sport camp let them pay and then let them come and then you use that to, to talk about the need for um recreation whatever it is that your mission or think what is an event you can do some people they even do like another one that was part of like they they, they serve refugees right people from different parts of the world who are who because of maybe war issues they, 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 they are here in the u.s so guess what they do like they, they will not tell people them to cook their food different food and invite people to come and eat the food and then they pay for a ticket so it can be $15, $25, depending on how many food you want to taste. And then they use that to help them to, to raise money for their work. So I want you to start thinking, what can you do as an organization? What event? And you don't necessarily have to do the event. Like I said, you have different options to choose for in the funding. But maybe for this quarter, events might not be, be the right step for you. That's fine. But for those that it's the right step for, look at it and use it. Maybe just maybe next year that you can think of activating an event. Some people do gala. 
They will invite people, they'll say dress up, there'll be music, there'll be dancing to show cultural stuff. And then people will pay money to come to Dalala to watch the show, like talent stuff and everything. And then people will sing, dance, do plays, and they will eat. And then they'll share about their organization and the work they do. And then they will ask you to pledge money. And then they do that. So different possibilities. So if you have ideas, if you, if you can think of one for event, put it in the comments so that we can hold you accountable as you continue to go along. So that's events. The next one will be grants. There are grant opportunities all over the world, within your country, within your state. Like, look, how many grants do you want to apply for next quarter that are available for you to apply for? How many grants are you going to pursue? Four, five, three, whatever is realistic and attainable for you. Put it down. You're going to look into five grants and see how we can apply for it and those kind of things. And then corporate sponsorship. There's so many businesses, small business, medium-sized business, regional business, international business. How many of them have you really reached out to to support the work that you do? How many of them have you introduced your work to? How many of them have what you need, whether in kind or cash? But you, you are not asking, you're not opening your mouth to ask, to speak, to knock, and say, you know what? You may not know us, but this is what we do. This is how we support the work. We help young people. We train them in, 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 to be employable, to, be, to have skills. And these are the people that will come and work for your company in the future. So you, by investing, giving to us, this is how you're helping us. And this is how you're helping yourself in the future. So you can, there's different ways that you can do your appeal. So how many of those corporate sponsors, businesses, can you reach out to in your community? 10, 15, 20, and say like every day, each month, I'm going to call one corporate business person and talk to them about this and how they can support our work and improve the work that we do. Then the number four is income generating activities. Like I said, it can be product or services. I told you the ones that I did with my organization. We did farming. We, we, we planted um, crops, we planted um, um, vegetables, we did um, egg rearing. We had a thousand beds that were rearing eggs for us. So we did that and we sold that. We even sold this thing, liquid wash. <laughs> I went to learn how to make soap, liquid wash soap. And then I taught it to my students, my secondary school students that we were working with. And then we used, normally like, you know, like maybe a liquid wash used to cost like 100 naira then in Nigeria. I went during that period. We still are home for 250 per liter. And we said, you're not just washing your plate and having nice clean plates. Because of this, if by you invest in our own liquid wash, you are sending this child to school. You're providing supply material to them. You're doing this to them. So that's how we were able to pitch it. And we used to get people that buy our liquid wash because of what we do. So they, they get something good. They get to wash their plates. But at the same time, they're doing good as well. So we did liquid wash. Like I said, we did um, training and speaking. The way we go and train and speak at private schools, because we were working with public school students. So we trained them. And the money that they give us there goes to helping us to do the work that we do with our own public school students. So I want you to start thinking, what can you do? What do you have in your hand right now? What skill set? What educational background do you have that you can use? That it's just about you taking some planning, thinking. They can activate to generate the money that you need to be able to do your work. Why you wait for the grant to come? Why you wait for the corporate sponsors to come? What else can you do? Then like the monthly giving program, which is like, when are you going to start that? It's not enough for people to give you once. How can you retain them to give you monthly? Can you get, can your target will be like in this next quarter, Q4, our goal is to get 50 people who commit to giving for the next one year, starting from October this year to September 2022, that maybe they'll give 1,000 euro per month consistently to our organization or give 2,005 or give 500, whatever that amount is. So I want you to decide out of all of these things, which of them are you going to do? Share it with us in the chat so that we can keep you accountable um, as we continue to grow as well, okay? And we are rounding up gradually. And then now to your 90-day plan, we have this up in your worksheet. Um, it's not, it doesn't look exactly like this, but it is there as well. And the goal is like for your Q4, you want it to, like I said, I want this to be practical. I don't just want you to come, have 20 hours with us and leave without anything. I want you to have a plan. So after this session, today is Thursday, um, tomorrow is, today is Friday, sorry. So you have the weekend, you have Saturday, you have Sunday. Lock yourself in a room, find somewhere quiet. We watch this again and make the plan. Like get paper and pen out. If you cannot print your stuff, write it with your hand and then start making the plan. I want you to do it, do the work because it's not enough for you to be here. This is just, okay, I'm not impressed. 
is when you do the work, when you actually do the work, that's when I'm going to be impressed, okay? And so this is the plan. In January, what are you going So this will be thinking October, November, December, right? Because we're getting into Q4, we're in Q3 now. So Q4, what are you going to do for September or for October, for November, for December? Or you can start your own Q4 early and say, okay, September will be my test run. So I'll do September, October, November, December, September, October, November, because December is going to be all day. So you can change it up. You don't have to follow the yearly calendar like we do. Like, so you have to be September, October, November. I'm going to plan it that, okay, September, I'm going to start my Q4. Then December, whatever happens, whatever happens, happen, okay? And so this can be, okay, what activity are you going to do in September? What is it going to cost you? Who is responsible? That's what I mean by owner. What is the projected amount that you want to raise from this event, whether you are doing an event or if you apply for a corporate sponsorship? What are you looking into? Or if you start your monthly giving program, then what is the income sources expense? If you remove the money it takes for you to get the material help, to do the brochure, to hire the person to do the, the graphic design, how much is left after you, you recoup all of those expenses? Then what is the goal? Like, do you want to deepen the relationship? Do you want to expand it? Do you want to do increase your donor acquisition? Do you want to increase your team? It can even be for team. Team, we need to recruit experts in communication, in, in fundraising, accounting, whatever it is, and then put a note down so that whoever is next, your team member can be carried along as they go along in, in those regards as well. And you can do more than one thing. So you can do different things. Like it's okay, two, we're going to focus on two funding pathways per, 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 per month. So we're going to work on monthly giving. We're going to work on events. Or in October, we're going to work on grants. We're going to work on corporate sponsorship. And then in November, we're going to work on income generating activities and board member giving. So depending on where you are, you can decide that, that, okay, this is what I want to do next. This is what we need to do next. And then you go from, from it and you go forward as you continue to um, move along as well. And then this is, then last but not the least, um, in, we are rounding up now and then we'll have time for question and answer. We'll be like creating a sample project budget for your organization. So once you have all of these things that you know exactly what you're doing, how much you need to do it, then it's easy for you to plan it out. And, create, and start creating your budget for next year or next fiscal year for your organization. Okay, this is our goal. Like we have individuals or monthly giving program. This is what I project in January. Where if we have 50 people giving us 1,000, that's 50,000. That come in January, 50,000 in February for your monthly giving program, if you're able to retain those. Then for corporate sponsorship, if you reach out to 10 organizations and let's say five of them in January gave you 10,000, it's another 50,000. In February, if you reach out to 15 and 10 of them gave you 10,000, that's 100. So it doesn't have to stay the same, it can increase. It can increase as the month increases as well. And then let's say for grant, oh, this is the, we apply for five grants, we got two and just 3,000. In February, we apply for another five, we got one, then it was 1,000. You can. You can really plan this and know that. And then beyond just planning the funding streams coming in, you should also plan the expenses. So that's the bottom part of it. Like, like how, how much is going to technology, to internet, to uh, computer, to phone calls? How much is going to operation, like transportation, um, um, money to pay for rent for where we are using uh, or what we are renting, communications, like your email list, if you are paying for that and all of that, or paying an intern a, a, a certain amount of money just to say thank you for them to help you to keep your Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or whatever going as well. Like if you have to attend a conference, like this webinar is free, but some of you might be part of the Ideation of Africa um, program. They have programs and courses that they, they, they sell for your good. So if you buy that, you can list all of those things here as well. Then professional develop, like whatever it is that your organization does, you need to list each of those things and what you do, and then each, each month, it's not every month that you, you do all of those things, but there are some that they are constant that every single month you have to pay for those things. And then in some months, you don't have to pay for them as well. So you list all of those things out and you know exactly what it is. So that, that way you can see, are we in deficit? Is it a minus that only 5,000 came in and we spent 10,000 in January? Or are we in surplus that 15,000 came in in March and we only spent 10,000? So you'll be able to know where you are and how things are in your organization. You have a clear picture. Where do you need to work hard on? What do you need to cut? And things like that as you continue to grow and develop. Next slide, thank you. And then this is now the final side, which I'm going to teach you, your, like knowing your core number. And so your core number is, the key, is asking you, how much do you need to do the work that you do, to serve, to help the people that you help per person? 
per day, per week, per month. Because when you're doing grant, whether it's grant or when you're trying to get somebody to give you money, whether it is corporate sponsorship or whether it's, you need to know that number because that number will drive it. You know, okay, if we're serving 50 people, then we need, and for one person to serve, let's say you serve, um, you want to serve 10 people, let's start with 10. You want to serve 10 youth. And you, part of, look for me, my own program, we used to give them food every day, every lunch. We feed them lunch, Monday to Friday. And we used to have like 100 then. But let's just say like, if we want to start with 10. 10 people, we have to feed them Monday to Friday. And then what is the cost of feeding one person? If that's the program I want to raise money from. But even within your program, there might be mini programs. There might be, <laughs> so within those programs, there may be other programs. So this is our um, after school, tutoring program but beyond just the tutoring we have to feed our children because we realize that if we don't feed them they don't pay attention because most of them did not eat since yesterday they had to walk to school they didn't they didn't give them any money for break or anything or breakfast and so when they come to us they're looking for gary coolie coolie they're looking for food or and and then they are distracted and they cannot focus and we saw how that was affecting their performance that if we try to teach them their mind is somewhere else because they're so hungry so we have to now and that was how we found out through doing our program, we're reviewing and saying, this thing is not working. This thing that's supposed to be moving from D to C, and they're still on D. <laughs> this something is wrong. And then we did the review and say, we realized food is an issue. So we included food. And so that we now have to create a whole food budget. And that's to look for people who can sponsor the food. And so we okay, okay, 10 people. And I realized that actually it costs almost like $60, 60 naira per day to feed them. Like one day we do bread and butter, bread and sandin. And now it might just be jollof rice. And now it might be whatever it is, jam and, and stew or yam and something. And I'm like, okay, it, take, it takes about 60 naira per, per day per child. So that means like 60 times five. That's 300 naira per week for one child. Then we are now feeding 10 of them per week. This is an example, right? That's 3,000 per week per child. So 3,000 times four, that's four weeks in a month. That's 12,000 naira that is going to cost us for 10 child. And then even I'll do it for 100, that is 120,000. For us then, our budget per month for food alone was 150,000 naira. 150,000 naira every single month went to feeding 100 kids that was in our program then. So that's why you're, knowing your corner by is important. So when I go to my board members, when I go to somebody I just met that they are interested in children and youth and poverty and hunger, I can say, this will be a dream. This is how you can support us. You can sponsor a child for a day or for a week or sponsor four or sponsor five. I can go to corporate bodies to say, this is how you can help us. Or go to Indomie and say, the manufacturer of Indomie, that we need packs of Indomie because we spend this money per week. We, we do Indomie twice a week, Indomie and egg. And this is what it costs us to make Indomie for these children and those kind of things as well. So that's why you need to know your number. So to calculate your core number, you need to know first, total amount of expense. How much does it take to do this? Whatever it is, whether it's your mentoring, your food program, whatever. And then total number of people you're servicing. That's what I mean by unit of service. So for us, of 100 students. And we do it per week, then we do it into a month. And so that's, those are the two things that you need. And then the next will now be to say, okay, during the calculation. So you calculate it by... So I have an example that I'm going to show you, and then we are going to um, go. So let's say that this is an, uh, there's an animal shelter, right? And so, and thinking of the unit of service, like they're taking care of one dog per day, right? So they rescue a dog, they feed it, they shelter it, they find it at home. So it seems simple, Abby, okay? But let's go deeper. So let's say the shelter, the, the shelter spent 500,000 last year after they did their review, running their facility. So that includes like caring for the dog. And then the total number of dogs that they cared for last year was 3,500 dogs during that year. So that means that when we did that, divide 500,000 by 3,500 dogs, what we find is $142.86. But if you go to someone and say, can you give us $142.86? It will look somehow, right? So we have to break it down for that to say, okay, uh, how can I just give you $142.86 to take care of a dog? But this is not the full story, right? So let's go to the next slide. So this is how we're not okay. No, actually, it take, on typical days, a dog stays with us for 21 days. So when we break $142.86 divided by 21 days, 
per day, what it costs for us to take care of this ch- um, dog, feed it, make sure it has everything it needs, is $6.80 per day. Now we are talking. Now the number makes sense, right? And now this is the number that we can now use to do that. And so that's how you know your core number, okay? And this is how you break it down. So I want you to calculate your core number and say, how much does it cost for us to do this service per day, per week, per month? So you know your core number so that wherever you are, whether you are writing a grant, doing a corporate pitch or pitch or something, you know what it costs to serve your people per day, per week, per month, per quarter. So put it in the, in the chat. Do you know your core number? If you don't know, now you have the formula. And I want you to do that and, and make the time to, to actually calculate it. So the next time you speak, you have the opportunity to definitely show that you know what you're talking about. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. And now um, we will go into questions. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Motala. It's been a very pragmatic and insightful session. Wow. Wow. So, 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 so pragmatic. Thank you so much. All that you have shared has been so invaluable, um, very practical, and I'm sure everyone who has joined in tonight will still have to go back to do the proper homework which is sitting with the worksheet and probably, pro- properly listening in again to the replay of this webinar. And um, you know, they begin to create um, the fundraising plan, the bulletproof fundraising plan as you have taught us tonight. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Motola, for the investment. We really do appreciate it. So at this juncture, we will be taking questions. So if you have um, any questions, Kindly share in the comment section. We will be um, we will be um, uh, receiving questions at this point. Um, ahead of you sharing your questions, we have a few questions for Dr. Motala, and we will want her to um, provide us answers to um, some of these questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Motala, once again. Um, it really has been an insightful session, and we really, really are grateful for the time invested. So um, there's a question I know um, bugs the hearts of many social entrepreneurs or um, nonprofit um, professionals, which will which bothers on are funding opportunities open to nonprofits who are still nonprofits and social enterprises who are still in the planning stage of launching the organization. Is there a baseline to which organizations have to meet before, rather a baseline organizations have to meet before they can start to seek funding? Absolutely, Absolutely. that's a great that's question. A great so I will so say I'll that, say sorry, I'm echoing. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Okay. okay, so this is how it goes. One, it's okay, okay. if they're just still planning. Because the truth is, yes, you have to start somewhere, right? And the way the way that it works is like, when you look at these funding pathways that I shared with you, you have to start with what you know that you can earn you right now. So for instance, for you, if you're just starting, you can do events, you can do income generating services and products, and you can go for individuals. Those are going to be the top three, three funding pathways, I will tell you to pursue. Because for grant and corporate sponsors, some of them will say, no, we want you to be registered. We want you to have, have had, some even say, you have to be registered for two years before they can even give you money or give you resources and things like that. So based on where you are, you are still fundable. Because you still can get money to help you in planning and getting ready to launch your first project or program. But you just have to know where you are. And once you know that that's where you are, then what you need to do is just to activate income generating products and services to start. And then board members, as you're planning, your board members can also be the important people there to support your work as you go forward. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Dr. Matala. So she's she's really shared that you can start from you know 
the um, low angle fruit in the um, from the pathway that she shared, which which could be starting with um, income generating um, products and also seeing seeking out opportunities of you know getting your board members to also fin finance that program. Um, there's a question here, Dr. Matola, for you, which reads: um, Is it appropriate for nonprofits to have internal streams of income, considering we are not supposed to be making profits? She says, um, internal streams of income, like income generating products and services. Absolutely, it is very appropriate. See, your nonprofit or NGO is just a status, it's a tax status. You see, these people, um, when they make money, it's for good. It, it's to do their program, and to do good back to the community, okay? So it's just a it's, it's just a classification. So you can make money as a non-profit. You should be making money as a non-profit or as a social enterprise. The only thing you cannot do with the money that you make, which makes you different from a for-profit, is taking the money as your personal money and say, this is my profit. I'm going to keep it for myself. No. You can use it to pay your staff. You can use it to pay yourself if you are the executive director or program director and you're doing the work. You can use it to do your services like helping, mentoring, tutoring, feeding, pay for all your um, expenses. But the only thing you cannot use it for is say like it's for me because I'm the funder, because I'm the owner, then I'm going to take all the money. That's what you cannot use it for. But yes, you should be making money. You can make money. There's nothing in the creation that says that you cannot make money because you're a non profit. The only thing is that you cannot take all the profit or all the money and say, I'm the owner, I'm going to it's just my personal money. No, that's the only thing that you can do with it. Thank you so much, Dr. Motola, for sharing. Just as you have um, emphasized, the, the, the profit there should go back to the expansion of, of the social impact work and not for self aggrandization Thank you so much. Um, just as you have attested, funding is ex essential for the growth of any nonprofit. While navigating this funding application terrain, are there right and wrong funding opportunities? If yes, how does one identify that? Absolutely. Yes, so there are. So I'll say not every funding is for you. Especially when we think of grants and corporate sponsorship. There are some people I'll never go to for money in corporate sponsors. And I'll tell you why. Because they, they are like this, in disalignment with the vision and the mission of my organization. So I'll give you an example. So for me personally, like, so you have to decide for yourself as, in, um, as the executive director or the funder. I won't necessarily go to, um, let's say, some, a, an alcoholic company and say, give us money. Because uh, it doesn't align with what we value in my organization. So, for me, and but that was, that's my personal one. For you, you might like, oh, we don't care about that. We just want people to give us money. I'll take money from anybody, and that's fine. So you have to look at your value and say, does this align with my value? And the same thing, the funders and the corporate sponsors too, they're also judging you too. Because they have their own value, they have their own mission, they have their own vision. So before you apply for a grant, before you seek out corporate sponsorship, or even for individuals, ask yourself, what do they value? And you can easily see it on their website, on their social media, the things they post, the things they share, the things they comment on, and that can say, okay, does it align with our value? Does, does it emulate what we're trying to make happen in the world? If it doesn't, then don't do it because you will be in misalignment, right? So you have to first do that research work and say, okay, are we in alignment? Is there something that they have that we, we believe in and something that we have that they believe in? And when you that aligns then yes go for it but if it doesn't align no matter how you try to do it you'll just be wasting your time because either they'll tell you no and you said i wasted all of my energy and then so you need to really review and look at it and then determine that and make that personal decision for yourself 
Thank you so much, um, Dr. Motala, for that. I love how you emphasized the need for value alignment, even while you know um, putting together your fundraising plan and in, in the full um, execution. So th there's another question from a participant who says, is it appropriate to employ the use of beneficiaries in the income generation strategies, like making products for sale? How do you draw the line between exploitation and volunteer services when you're working with teenagers? That's a great question. That is it. And like, you know, I mentioned with my that yes, like we use them because part of our own curriculum was teaching them, yes, we help them with academics. We teach them about leadership and also about social entrepreneurship. So the way that we were able to make sure that we were not exploiting them was like, so some students, we had for their interest. So for those who were interested in agriculture, we paid them for their time. So it's not like they were doing it for free. Yes, they were part of our program. But for every, if they do five hours a week, we have an agreement that we pay you this amount of money. And then we also do profit sharing too, because we were planning for like helping them to go to university. And so they'll need money for like wire jam application, paying for their first year of tuition. So we created a plan where some of those money, they have the um, autonomy to say, I want 50% of it to go towards this. And I want the many 50% or I want the all 100% for me right now. And so in whatever you're doing, yes, it is okay. But like you, you said, you cannot take it for granted. So you have to, do, are they interested? Do, do they, um, are you going to treat them well and, and pay them for their time and their service? Or share the profits with them if it's possible or use it to plan for their future. So those are the things that we considered before making them come. But remember, a part of our curriculum was social entrepreneurship and teaching them to be job creators. So we we're teaching them those skill sets for those that were interested. And then that product that they created, we bought the materials. But they did the work, and so we're able to share the profits and still pay them for their time. So if you can do those things, and there is no cheating or there is no like using that we're using them. But if you don't have those things in place, then there might be issues that come along in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Martella. So there's another question here um, from Deborah. We say, which tweets um, first, any advice on calculating call number in this case? Um, she's saying, let me read this case particularly. So she shared um, a, a, a scenario. She says, my nonprofit pays medical bills of chronically sick persons who can't afford it. That means the prices differ largely due to the degree of medical conditions. So in this particular case, she's asked, seeking um, what advice can, can what, what advice can you prefer, you know, in terms of calculating the call number for this uh, particular um, case, case scenario? Yeah, it's possible, it's possible. So what I want you to do, Deborah, is look at the people you've worked with, the people you've paid their medical bill, and then look at it, what kind of diseases or issues or challenges do you pay for? So you have to categorize them. So let's say it's somebody that was pregnant and then they gave back and then they had CS and they couldn't pay the money. And you, you've seen the trend that usually depending on the hospital or clinic, it's about 50,000 to 100,000 Naira that is needed. So you have an average, right? So I'll tell you to pick the higher number. So let's pick 100. So if your goal is to help 20 people that are pregnant and cannot afford to the delivery fee, so you now give, you, you, you can have your calculation, okay, 100 plus 50,000 plus whatever the amount that you've used in the past for the people that you've helped, then divided by the total number of people you've helped. So let's say for one person you paid 100, another person 75,000, another person 50,000, then you divide that and that will give you an average. Does that make sense? So for that particular 
issue or diseases or like health crisis, you need to categorize them by that. So you can't just lump everything up as one. But okay, we see these people that have this particular situation. This is the total cost and this is the average per person that we use. And it takes them three months to stay in the hospital for this total amount. So you divide that total amount by three months, then you get your call number. Does that make sense? So that's how you can do it for that particular situation. I hope thank you. Helps. Thank you so much, Dr. Machala, for um, the very brilliant response. So there's another question that I think I know um, most nonprofits and social enterprises um, would always um, um, want answers to, or want an answer to rather. So the question goes thus. Is there a funding season for nonprofits? Well, already you have told us the different funding pathways, and you know the importance of calendarizing. You know your smart goals across the year. But nonetheless, people still ask that question: Is there a funding season for nonprofits, and where can an organization find some of these funding opportunities? Already you have preferred that in the funding pathways, but you can be more pra pragmatic, maybe giving us ex examples across the different funding pathways. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. So I believe there are funding seasons and you can create your own too. So with grants, like usually we're about to get into the funding season for grants. It starts usually from September to around April of next year. So that's the one for grants. Because depending on the organization and the funders, they are different. Some people, they'll do it once a year, they'll do the proper application. Some, they do it every quarter. Some, they'll say that, oh, only in one quarter in a year, between September and November, then you get the money in December, January. So that's the one for grants. For individuals, like to, give, to get people to give you individually, there's no season. You determine the season. So it's the number of your own outreach. And but usually think about it. One of the ways that people give the period that people give is like first six season. So if we were to create a season for individual donor, Christmas is one, Easter or doing all of these big, big celebrations, that's more when people are leaning towards giving because they're thinking about their life, they're doing Thanksgiving and I'm gonna share them for the year. So that can be a top season for you. So your season will be December to February if you were to create one for individual donors for giving. And then for corporate sponsors, it's almost along the same line as well with grants. Some of them may have a formal, formalized season, but most of them don't. Also use that season too. Like you can use quarters. A lot of these corporate organizations, they have monthly goals, monthly target or quarterly target. So you can do it back on like March, June, August. I'm going to, and so you can do that. So you, you can study them and say, okay, wait, when do these people tend to like be more inclined? When was the giving pattern last year? And then you do that research, then you can know as well to, to help you to continue to do that. And then for events, I guess depending on where you have the state, the city, the continent, that can also determine what events work. So you know that every September students go back to school. So August, September can be your back to school for events. You know that during Christmas period, people want to give, they have festive, they buy clothes and everything. So that can be a time that you do feeding program or something like that for you. So you you can determine it yourself or you can study your environment and determine that okay this is what i noticed this is the culture this is what this looks like and then now plug yourself in your organization's work in between that culture and what the environment does so i hope that helps yes it does thank you so much dr matala so there's another question uh, which is a follow um, up to the uh, questions that I've asked. So after an organization has been able to secure funding, what are the next steps that an organization should take to ensure the secured funding is well utilized and maximized? That's a really great question and I'm glad that you're already thinking in line with that. So the first thing will be say, read the fine print. So what I mean by that is, is one, understand that whoever is giving you money they might have their own set of things that they want you to report back on so if you tell them that i want to feed 100 children 
make sure you use the money for feeding under children. Not that you know how to your mind after you got the money and say, well, I just want to train people. You have to communicate with them because next time you go to them, they will not want to fund you because you didn't live up to your word, right? So that's one thing that you should know. And then also, do realistic budget things. Don't just do, oh, I think it will cost 1,000 naira. No, go and ask those vendors, those people that you're going to use, and really get the estimate, the real estimate. Don't just say 1,000. Do it is 5,220 cobalt. Put that there and use that. And so work with the budget that you created. If you can create a realistic budget, it helps you when you're now executing on the project, right? In that regard. Then also another thing is like keep them along. Let's say the project is going to take four months, five months. Don't wait until when you need money next six months from now that you now go back and say, oh, by the way, this is what we did. And no, um, step of the way. Like just say, I know that you didn't require these, but I just want to let you know, we've done stage one of this project. These are next stage. This is the report we have. These things are changed. So sometimes you might project for something and then you under project or over project. You can let them know, oh, we over projected. This is, this is how we're going to make adjustments or this is how we're going to make up for it. They will honor and respect you more than just, just doing it and without doing that. So those are the things I would say that you should watch for. That just because you've gotten the money, that's the end. Actually, that's when it's very critical for you to really manage it well and to be a good keyword of what you are giving. And so record everything, um, get receipts if you can, and just make sure that you document as much as possible so that you can tell them this is exactly how we use it. This is the timeline that we followed, and this is the result and the outcome as a result of what we did. So documentation, following the plan that you proposed, and if there's a change, communicating those changes as you go along. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Motala. Finally, um, the, yes, our, our, our last question. What are some mistakes common to social enterprises or nonprofits? Um, common mistakes that social enterprises or nonprofits make, which makes them unable to access funding. What come what, what come what are some of the common mistakes social enterprises or nonprofits um, make that that makes um, access to funding um, impossible. Absolutely. So I'll say the top three is going it alone. So one of the things I, I notice a lot is that you don't want to collaborate. You think that, oh, my, it's my idea, I'm the funder. I'll tell you the truth. When I started my own nonprofit, I collaborated with every other people around me that were doing something similar. So one example was um, Sodexo Network, or so, uh, so Aero Network. Um, he, he, the founder was Dr. Shegun Fadi Tumi. And he started his own, but he was not working on tutoring. He was focused on leadership alone. So we, he approached me and said, you know what, we don't have a space right now. Can our students come to you and do tutoring and then we can exchange leadership and your students can come to us for leadership. That was wonderful because now we don't have to worry about money or expense for leadership. So they took on that and then we helped them with and so we did exchange of services. And up to now, even though we are in different places and we still communicate, we still engage. Anything I is doing, I support it. Anything I'm doing is supporting it. So build collaboration among other visionaries, among other social good um, 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 executives as well. Don't just say that, oh, it's just by myself. You don't understand. No. Leverage the opportunity, leverage the passion that other social um, change makers and social savers are doing and use that opportunity. So don't go it alone. That's one of the things I see. The second one is um, under budgeting. A lot of you, you under budget for the things that you need. You, you, you think that, oh, if I make my budget small, then they'll fund me. Actually, for those corporates, for those grant funders, they know the real deal. So they're like, this person is not serious. 
they've not done their research because you think that oh, by me making it small that's what will make them fund me but that is even giving them more doubt in your capacity and your expertise to deliver the work so stop undercutting yourself stop undercutting your program stop undercutting the money that you should pay your staff because they deserve to be paid well i'll give you an example when i was running my own organization my program manager was earning 100,000 naira and it was still too small that was in 2012 2013 and I still have other benefits that I provided for them. So don't undercut it and say, oh, we'll just pay you 50000 or 25000 and just bear with it. Like, put it in your program. For us to do this job well, these staff members have to be paid well too. So this is what is going to cost. So don't um, under budget yourself and undercut yourself. And then lastly, not networking. You think that, oh, I'm just going to stay in my corner. I'm not going to share about the work. Like, spread it to everywhere. Go on Facebook Live, Instagram Live, LinkedIn Live. Share your passion. Show the behind the scenes. Interview some beneficiary or their parents or the stakeholders the, 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 that you're partnering with. And let the world know. Don't just say that, oh, like, I don't want anybody to know. I don't, like, stop playing Umbu. Umbu is not going to help you because more than ever the need is great and we need more people to do this work and people will not know what you're doing if you're not willing to share that and put yourself out there and be visible so be visible network any opportunity you have champion your cause fight for the people the community the country that you're fighting for like speak good about what you're doing how you're making a difference so don't be shy about the impact of the work that you're doing I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Mortala. In your final words, you, you've shared with us um, the power of collaboration. The, the also the, the very potential point which um, ties towards ensuring that you're not undercutting, you know, your um, 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 budgeting or fundraising um, 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 expectation. And also, finally, you, you are emphasizing the need for networking we cannot you know gloss over it over this it is so powerful and we must continue to announce it um thank you so much dr motala I, I just wanted to share some final words just before we call it a night your final words to all of our um, change makers social innovators and social saviors tuned in tonight so how i'd like to say that um first and foremost i'll thank you thank you for taking on this work Thanking up for picking up the back, back thing, the back thing and the back thing. Because you could have chosen to do any other thing with your life, right? But you choose to do this. So it matters and I am grateful for you. And then secondly, like I said, don't be afraid to collaborate. Don't be afraid to ask people for help. Don't be afraid to champion the work that you're doing and say, this is what we are fighting for. This is the future we are fighting for. More than ever, we need you to speak out. And really take your place and let people listen to say that this is how we are making change happen, right? And last but not the least, know that your possibilities are endless. And I am rooting for each and every one of you. And if you ever need help, I'm just a message away on Instagram or LinkedIn or stuff like that. So, and then also take advantage of what ideation of is offering you, and really get into the community and and collaborate with each other and be able to do more good work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matala. Um, we have really had a very, very, very insightful session. Really, it's been um, um, an impactation of valuable and sound um, knowledge. And definitely, we know taking it a step forward, we are going to run with application. And definitely, um, we will see the results that we desire. All right. Okay. So, um, no worries. Yes, we will definitely share um, Dr. Motala's um, handle. But uh, maybe Dr. Motala, you could share your uh, um, social media handle. Um, yes, possibly. So that um, no, you could just say it out. You know, yeah, it, it's at the funding magnet. So if you go on link Instagram at the funding magnet. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Machala. Thank you to all of our um, very um, um, passionate social saviors and change makers out there who have taken our time tonight to learn because it's in learning that we know. And I love the fact that, you know, we have had a lot of people share very positive feedback about the, the impact of this particular session. So more importantly, I encourage you, we encourage you to go back, utilize the worksheet, which is sitting pretty in our very latest email newsletter to our community. So if you have not accessed it, go back to that email newsletter or go into the Telegram community and download the worksheet from there. And then you can come back to sit with this replay and definitely create a plan. And definitely we look forward to um, hearing your testimonials as a result of this session. Once again, we encourage you to plug in into the Ideation of Africa community. There is a lorry load of, of, of value, you know, value in, in, in the area of social innovation that we have stored up for you. And you can't access this, this information of this value without being a part of the community. So please plug in. We really do encourage you to do that. Thank you all for joining in tonight. So our very quintessential and, and, and brilliant Dr. Matala Kishola, we do we duly, duly feel honored to have you on our platform. And we, we really appreciate the fact that you came with your A-game. Thank you so much. And to everyone, we say enjoy a very blissful weekend. And we encourage you, please apply the knowledge that you have acquired. We want to also we, want, we look forward to hearing your very great testimonials as a result of this insightful session. Thank you all, and do enjoy the rest of your weekend.